Good evening and welcome to See You at USC. My name is Sam Newman and tonight we have Judith Shelton, a stand-up comedian and USC professor. It's going to be a great interview. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for sticking with us. And tonight, once again, we have Judith Shelton on the couch. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. Ah, uh, thanks for having me. I'm very well, thank you. Great. So let's jump right in. Okay. I just want to get, because we have a lot to talk about yes. tonight. So I want to start at the beginning, because you've had a really long career. And what I, I'm, it's been a great career. <laughs> um, and, um, and I'm sure it's going to be do great things. Yeah. M even more. Um, so where I want to start is kind of, at the beginning with your community and where you grew up and what inspired you to get into comedy? Because I know that a lot of stand-up comedians use their past as inspiration for the comedy that they talk about and you know their mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. So was there a moment for you that inspired you to get into comedy? What was your community like growing up? Well, it was interesting. I, um, I, I say that I was raised by nuns. I went to live with um, Catholic nuns in Colorado, and they were hilarious. They were <laughs> truly, truly hilarious. So they're kind of my very first inspiration. But when I knew I wanted to be a comedian, I was obsessed with Bugs Bunny growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as a wee young person, I had some trouble with bullying. And... Um, somebody threw a pizza at me once and mm -hmm. I, I had been having trouble coping with that. But one day in the lunch yard, we had a yard, um, I got hit with a pizza and it just came to me to fake this huge death scene. <laughs> so like, you know, it was all red yeah. and I was like, Gah! and I just did this whole death yeah. scene and people started laughing and I was like, I'm going to save myself. <laughs> and so comedy saved me from that moment. And I was probably in fourth grade and it just saved my life. And were there moments before that where you had, you know, been, uh, you've been faced with bullying and you kind of didn't have the opportunity to use comedy? Yes. I took it really personally. You know, of course, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, so I, I took it inward. And then when I, that, you know, when I got hit with the pizza, I was like, oh, you know, it's just really was watching Bugs Bunny. How would Bugs Bunny deal with it? so weird. Yeah. I still kind of <laughs> ask myself that question a lot. That's so interesting. Yeah. So do you think that that, you know, how Bugs Bunny does it, do you think that plays into your comedy now? Yes. Like your brand of comedy? Yes, yes. So what is your, what do you consider your brand of comedy and how did that relate to that moment for you? Ah, good question. I still, I'm very physical. I'm not quite as physical as when I was a younger comic. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit of an older comic now. But when I was a young comic, I was extremely physical. Um, did a lot of bad magic, um, dance routines, all kinds of you know commercials and sort of sketches in my stand-up, which I think was really influenced by Bugs Bunny and all those cartoons of the day. Um, now, I still feel, now my comedy it's so weird. I keep getting older and my comedy gets younger. Uh -huh. I'm more playful. I say I'm a lot like a 13 year old boy. Uh -huh. Yes. So I'm very playful in my stand up. I talk a lot about myself. So I'm not doing political jokes. I'm not talking about the water crisis. Mm -hmm. I'm still sort of focused on myself. That hasn't changed. Um, but yeah, I would say I'm kind of uh, definitely a weird comic there I talk to my students a lot about the transient click which is the click between changing chords mm -hmm. and there's like a moment a moment of uncomfortability and that's kind of what my stand-up is all about people at first are like what and then they get into it and I just have to be patient and let them get on board so now you talk about how you use yourself and your past experiences in your comedy yeah. so now that requires a kind of vulnerability yes with comedy and I feel like that's something that a lot of students have probably have trouble overcoming, Hi. you know, just because to talk about yourself in front of a crowd and almost face rejection, mm -hmm. you know, and have the opportunity for rejection is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. Did you have trouble, you know, you talked about your pizza incident, but after that, as you started, you know, expanding your comedy, you know, portfolio, mm -hmm. you know, reflecting back on yourself, was that difficult for you? Never. 
uh, it's so weird. I've always enjoyed talking about myself and I don't know, ever since I was young, I felt pretty comfortable talking about what I was going through. And I don't know if it's just that somehow, I mean, drama, being around drama kids saved my life as well because we were all a bunch of misfits and we were very, all of us very open. When I was a young kid, I uh, I had a group of friends, we were called the Four Nothings, mm -hmm. and we were sort of the four invisible girls in school, but we really bonded, and I think through that friendship. So you just kind of have to find your tribe, and so I found my tribe, and in that tribe I felt comfortable to talk about myself. So with my students, I try to create the tribe in the classroom. From the beginning, I try and, um, I do talk a little bit about myself, um, and and then give them questions that they need to answer. Mm -hmm. And each student is different. Some go way in, some, some stay out a little bit. Both of those work for me. You, The student, the comedian gets to decide. And when do you kind of draw the line on like what you're willing to share and what you're not willing to share about Personally, yourself? About uh, like in your comedy. Yes. Because I'm sure for comedians, it's it's there is a line. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes you can go too far and sometimes, yeah. you know, you can face backlash for things that you say. Mm. For you, wh where is that line and how did you discover pushing that line, not crossing it enough? Like where, mm. when did you discover that sweet spot? This is a great question. Uh, sometimes, a lot of times in my life, the line has been drawn for me. So I'll push it and you can feel from the crowd, ooh, I went too far. When you start to get, oh, instead of laughs, it's like, okay, I went a little too far perhaps. Mm -hmm. Or when people come up to you after the show and ask if you're okay, you're <laughs> like, I went too far. Um, I'm willing to go that far. Yeah. And it might be a 2 percenter joke, 2% of the room might be into it, but if I can, and that's fine. Um, but sometimes the line is drawn for me. So starting out your career, you kind of, you went around to open mic nights doing stand-up comedy, and you talk about those awe moments and pushing mm -hmm. that line. So when you're doing stand-up comedy for the first time and you face rejection or people aren't laughing or people saying awe yes. or just a joke just doesn't land, yeah. you know, what is that rejection like and how do you get up from that? Oh, it's terrible. I am not ashamed to say that, especially when I was a younger comic, I would take to my bed. It hurt so bad, especially somebody like me. There's all different kinds of comics, but I talk about myself, so it's very true. If it doesn't go over, it hurts a lot, and I feel a deep sense of embarrassment. I really can. So when I was younger, I would take to my bed. I would have to get under the covers and sort of build myself back up. Um, now, I, it's, it's interesting, I think, um, now I'm sort of okay with not getting the love that I think I deserve or that I'm craving. It's okay, I'm working. As I get older, I'm more comfortable. I'm doing it more to make a connection with people, and to create community than I am to build up my spirit. You know, when I started comedy, I, this is terrible. This is going to get a lot of awful emails but when I started comedy I started because I liked funny guys mm -hmm. you know and I was like I want to be around funny guys and then I realized hey this is my thing I love this I yeah. love doing stand-up it's so gross that I just said that out loud but that's how needy I was when I started yeah. I really wanted a lot of attention and a lot of love yeah. I wanted a lot of love and so since that moment you've kind of discovered that it's really about emotional connections that's and right. building connections with people that's right what was that process like discovering it was there I I mean, it's hard to probably find a specific moment mm -hmm. where you recognize the connections that you can yeah. build with that someone, but was there that moment? And you know, what was kind of the thinking process behind that? Well, I think it was a lot of things. You know, um, life, life, your personal life should influence your stand-up. And I think personally, I've done a lot of spiritual work, a lot mm -hmm. of. Um, seeking and a lot of trying to be comfortable with myself and so I was always sort of checking in after shows how do I feel do I feel like I gave myself away or do I feel like I made a connection did I was I needy or was I free was I giving and it just was trial and error over time I was like you know the shows I love the most are the shows where I make a connection with people and it's less about me Oh, I'm talking all about myself and yeah. trying to work stuff out, but it's really more of how, you know, there's a lot of my stand-up is like, help me, and I'm fine with that because that yeah. involves them. 
Now, do you find that that stand up is therapy for you in some way? Yes. And Probably what about when? Be. Yeah. What about when you're right? I mean, it's always good to yeah. have that outlet for everything yeah. going on inside of you. So yeah. in stand up comedy, and you're making people laugh, and you're making a connection. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Right. But when you're writing down stand up comedy, you know, and you're and you're processing your thoughts, that's therapy for you. Do you find that? You know, helpful for you internally, yes. and then bringing that out and making a connection with people—it must yes. be incredibly rewarding. It is really rewarding because I believe what you exorcise in yourself, mm -hmm. it relieves outside. So the more you bring it to the surface, the less it dogs you in life. So the more I talk about my insecurities, actually, the better I feel about them because I am—I um, do—I'm a very lean-forward comedian. I do a lot of crowd work. I can see everybody in the room. I love making. Mm -hmm. eyeball connection with people which can freak some audience members yeah. out but I uh, see people acknowledging that they go through that too and it can help me relax a little bit but I have heard sometimes some criticisms about my class is that it's a lot like therapy but I don't see anything wrong with that no I don't think there's mm -hmm. I don't think people should see anything yeah. wrong with that yeah. so now you've taken Clearly, you succeeded at doing stand-up comedy because today you're a series regular on The Middle. No! Oh, no, you're not a series not. regular Boy, I wish I was. No, <laughs> no. I so just... you've been on The Middle. Yes, yes. And you were on Seinfeld. Yes, yes. So now, what were those experiences like? How did you, yes. how, you know, tell me about Seinfeld because Seinfeld yeah. is just such a classic show for people. Yes. You know, how, what was that like? What was it what, like working there? Um, well, it was really exciting. I was doing stand-up. I was doing a... Um, uh, a one, pr you know, I was doing like my comedy half hour at the HBO workspace, and there was somebody there from CBS who saw me and liked me. So she told her uh, superior, and um, I shoot, I can't remember exactly his title, but it was some big wig mm -hmm. in sitcom development, comedy sitcom development. So I uh, had a meeting with him, and um, in the meeting, they offered me a holding deal right then and there, which means that they pay you some money to hold you until they find you a place, in, in my case, at CBS. Yeah. Um, but I had, I contacted a friend's manager and that manager shot me around to other places and I got a holding deal at another network. Then they sort of battled it out and I landed at CBS. Um, and that came a little early in my career, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I always tell my students, you know, you want to spend some time developing, f you know, becoming stronger, being, you know, s yeah. um, I always call it like a river stone. Mm -hmm. You want to be pounded by that river over and over so that when somebody plucks you out, you're soft and smooth. I was still sort of a young comic yeah. and all this great stuff happened to me early. Um, so... Uh, I was, I did end up being a series regular on a show called The Gregory Hines Show in the 90s, mm -hmm. probably, I don't know, maybe before you were born. Um, but uh, yes, I, you know, success is an interesting thing for a comedian. Um, what I, yeah, I, I, things don't look exactly the way I planned. However, I really like the way things turned out. Yeah. That's great. Now we have to take a quick commercial break, so we're going to be right back, but I want to talk more about your teaching yeah. and your time at USC and Perfect. everything else because we have a lot to get to in the second half. Okay. So stay tuned with us and we'll be right back. And welcome back. Uh, my name is Sam Newman, and we're here with Judith Shelton. So just continuing the conversation. Um, so you've actually, you have a school where you teach stand-up yes. comedy, and you've taught over 800 students. Yes. You know, what does it feel like to, feel, to have an impact on all of these students? Oh, it is the joy of my life. I never thought I would be a teacher, um, and it is the joy of my life. I did not see my life turning out this way, but I adore it. I get to work with people who are brave, who are searching, who are trying stuff out, who are playful, who are rascally, mm -hmm. and I laugh all week long. I just laugh, laugh, laugh. That, I can't imagine anything better. That's amazing. Yeah. So now you hear about comedy, though, that you either like have it or you don't. Yes. So now, how do, you, how do you recognize students who have it and, and students who don't? Because I'm sure a lot of students come in 
uh, you know, thinking they have it and they may not. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that process of either making them recognize that they may not have it or, you know, what's your strategy in dealing with students who are either really good or, you know, who just don't have that, right. that comedy bug? Well, here's the thing. I actually, and I feel pretty confident saying this, I think everybody has it, mm -hmm. but having it is not enough. So I'll have students in my class and you know, there are some students, they get it the first day or they come in amazing. And then there are some students who don't get it till the show. Yeah. My classes are five weeks long, four weeks in a show, and there's a couple different levels if you want to take it. But the first part is just four weeks and then a show. Um, the, the, some students get it on the show, but the deal is, here's what stand-up is really about, is getting out and doing it in front of strangers over and over and over again. And I've had many students that I just look at them and I'm like, you're going to be a huge star. They go do one open mic, they're like, I quit! <laughs> and so having it is only, gosh, a small part of it. Really what you need is drive and ambition. Yes. So persistence is key, and yes. I, th I think we find that with with most professions, yes. especially ones where you know you need others' approval really yes. in it. So now you talk about in your uh, on your website, which people should definitely go and check out, mm -hmm. that you know you teach people who aren't even necessarily into comedy. Yeah. You know they could be doctors, engineers, mm -hmm. people who aren't even in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Why do you think those types of people come take your class? What attracts them to comedy and to and to working with you specifically? Well, there's a couple of neat reasons. One is people who are doctors and lawyers, they have this neat thing, this drive in them where th many of them come in and say, I want to do something that scares me. So that's the kind of person that became a doctor. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They work hard. They're really into doing things that are difficult. Um, also, I get a lot of people who take my class because they need to laugh. You know, there. I've had a, one day, one class, I had two different therapists in my class, mm -hmm. and it's because they needed to laugh. So it's both things. Here at USC, I had a medical student in my class, and she was amazing, just amazing, yes. Because we talked about earlier how, mm -hmm. you know, comedy is a form of a coping mechanism, yes. and it's a therapy session in and of itself. That's right. So everyone kind of needs that, especially in high-stress jobs like being yes. a doctor or, or a student, yeah. especially at USC, just to come into your class probably. I I would love to and get policemen. Relax. Policemen. That's my dream. Completely, yeah. you know, very high stress situations. Yeah. yeah. So now, was there a moment for you, you know, what inspired you to open this school? Like, what, 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 what got you into it? Okay, I'm gonna. Because be it's been a, it's been a few, it's been seven years, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. So, was there a moment for you? Well, you know, growing up, it, coming up in stand up. So I started stand up in 1993. Mm -hmm. Coming up in stand up, you didn't take a class. It was kind of looked down upon. So when a friend came to me and said, will you teach a stand-up class, um, I was like, absolutely not. He heck no, I will not do that. But I was in a weird situation where I needed a job, I needed inspiration, I needed something fun. And so I said I would do it. And I was really tentative about it. I just loved it. And it's not necessarily that I teach it, but I'm like a border collie. I'm right behind you and I'll nip you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We work real fast. You generate some material. It doesn't take the place of getting out into mics and doing comedy in front of strangers. That's really important. But I keep my classes really short. So we get to the point, they get out and do it. Um, so it's actually circumstance that got me into it but I'm really glad. And I think that's how a lot of things in life happen. And you said that you were hoping to find inspiration and have fun with it. Yes. Did you, fi did you yes. find inspiration? You said Absolutely. you have fun with it. Absolutely. I myself had gone through a phase where I didn't want to, I didn't want to do stand-up anymore. And um, I felt, I went through this weird phase where I didn't want to be exposed. And working with young comedians, I felt reinvigorated, re-inspired, and um, it gave me back my joy and my, my sense of play with it. Do you have goals for the next few years as your comedy, yes. as your comedy school continues? Yes. Like where would you like to see it go from here? Well, I wanna write a book. That's the first thing I wanna do. And I would love to travel. Um, you know, I always thought that I'd travel as an actor and you know, I have a little bit, but I would love to teach um, all over the world. I really would. I would love to find out what's what's going on in people's minds in all other places. I would like to get out and spread the message. And I suppose the message is a little bit 
I, I want my students to fall in love with themselves. Now, not the perfect version of themselves, probably the imperfect version mm -hmm. of themselves because that's where the comedy lies. And um, I see it happen all the time. My students come in, I ask them question, question, question. They get up and talk about it and they slowly fall in love with themselves. And whether they continue with comedy or they go on to something else, something is changed. And I would love to help people love themselves a little more. Now, did you fall in love with your imperfect self through yes, comedy? Yes, I totally, totally. If it wasn't for comedy, I don't know where I would be. I mean, I'm just a, a kind of a, a big, soft monster. If you really <laughs> think about it, I'm a, like a Godzilla figure, if you really take a look at me. So, yes, I, and I'm loud, and I'm noisy, and I say the wrong things, and guess where all of that worked in stand-up. <laughs> yeah. So now you also participated in this exhibit in downtown LA called yes. Laughing Matters. Yes. Do you mind explaining a little bit what the project was and what the themes behind it was and the motivation to get involved? Yes. Oh man, I should have, I'm a little older than you Sam, mm -hmm. and sometimes names fly out of my head. So I should have done some research there mm -hmm. about um, oh man, she's gonna be so mad at me and she's just this amazing person. Um, she started it, gosh darn it, Sam. I should have looked that up, Emma. Oh, nuts. It's okay. Anyway, <laughs> she was, um, you know what? Maybe I can give you the information and you can type it in somewhere. Sure, okay. we'll make sure to include it And somewhere. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna owe her such an email. But she came up with this great idea. She creates these pop-up exhibits that travel from place to place and they can be in the middle of a park. They can. The last one she did was about um, mothers who gave up their children for adoption. She's mm -hmm. just such a wonderful person and I'm a beast, a horrible beast that I can't remember her name at this moment. Um, but she wanted to do an exhibit about women in comedy because there is a belief that women aren't funny, mm -hmm. which hurts so deeply. Um, so she wanted to do an exhibit about, you know, looking at this, looking at some of the beliefs, looking at women who are funny, looking at our process, looking, looking at what we've had to deal with, looking at how there was a great portion of the exhibit where it looked at uh, female comedians' comedy albums and this idea you know, there was an, um, how many of the women looked like men on their comedy mm -hmm. albums and how over, you know, you know, when comedy, like in the 90s, all women wore like sport coats, you know, mm -hmm. jackets with pushed up, you know, we've just gone through a huge identity shift. And I think we're getting more into actually owning being women and talking to about women and for women. Um, it's a very difficult topic for me because it's so separatist and I can't stand division. I think anybody can be funny. They just have to be willing. They have to be brave. Of course. And we yeah. look at today's, you know, comedy landscape and the first people that come to mind yes. are always women. Yes. I mean, Maria Bamford, yes. Amy Schumer, yeah. you know, Tina Fey, yes. you know, yes. all of these amazing yes. female comics. So, but now you've been in, you've been in comedy for 25 years yeah. now. Uh -huh. um, have you noticed a change in the opinion of the industry in terms of female comics? Well, it's really weird. I'm luckily still friends with many, many, many comedians from when I started. Mm -hmm. So we're talking the very early 90s. And many of those people were women. It was crazy. We would go to an open mic, it would be half women. Because we had Roseanne Barr, Brett Butler, uh, Ellen DeGeneres. We had so much happening for mm -hmm. women. So there were tons of women. And then something happened. All the women went away. And you'd go to an open mic, there'd be one woman at the other side of the room, yeah. you know. and. Um, um, so something changed and it was really, really weird. So uh, I, I can't, oh, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about this, but um, I think the industry sometimes takes the easy way out. And if some, if a woman is hot, they'll look for other women. If men are hot, they'll look for other men. Whatever's hot, you know, if there's a show about six roommates or whatever, then they want six new shows about six roommates. So it's, you know, it's ebb, ebb and flow. Yeah. Interesting, but do you, do you think you know what that change was in the 90s that, that made it disappear? Or do you have an yes. idea? Yes, yes I do. It's not very popular. But I think, I think, oh, it's so terrible. I'm not even sure how to say it on live television. But this idea of women 
in my opinion only. I don't speak for other people. But we went through this interesting time where it became all about women's appearance once more. I think maybe social media, um, so much about women's appearance. And so I think women became very obsessed with how they appear to other people. And sometimes doing comedy, we have to be ugly. And are you hopeful, you know, in today's industry where women are getting a lot more roles and, you know, there are a lot of female comics, are we, are you more hopeful for the future now? Yes. Well, especially I have to say, I feel like, I, I haven't done the numbers exactly, but at least half my students here at USC are female and maybe even more. And the students in my school are women. I just feel like, I, I think a lot of us are pumping out a lot of great female comedians. So, so I'm really happy about so that. So is the future female? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is, Sam. <laughs> but I don't like the vision, so I'm happy for everybody to be in the future. Yeah. I think the future is inclusion. And yeah. that's a great place to end it on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I would love to continue talking with you. Um, you can check out more of Judy Shelton on her website. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Uh, this has been another episode of See You at USC. My name is Sam Newman, and you can actually stay tuned after this episode for another special episode with the founder of the Roski School here at USC, Gail Garner Roski. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Lynn Swan, and you're watching Trojan Vision. Fight on.